Come on, somebody. <laughs> I, love, I love this church. Amen, amen. You know, when my brother got me to go to Gulu, Africa, I preached in front of a, a few thousand pastors. And uh, over there, they don't clap and they don't amen. They go, loo, 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 loo. <laughs> the whole time. I loved it so much, I brought it back to America. Uh, we're now in 47 states. Wherever I go, I bring this message to them. And uh, it means I have victory over my enemy. So on three, if you got victory over your enemy, be loud about it. One, two, three. <laughs> Feel free to do it anytime, anywhere. Have fun with it. I love a loud, loud congregation. And uh, man, this place is on fire. Some of the finest people in Washington are right here. I haven't been smiled at and, and greeted so friendly anywhere I've ever been. And so you can give yourselves a hand clap. And to your amazing pastor, my incredible friend. Um, I got some books out there. I think we sold out uh, or close to selling out of a few of them. And uh, my books online, um, they're normally about 30 bucks online. But today they're one for... There are one for 10, two for 15, three for 20, four for 25. And uh, you won't find, you can actually buy them and then make a business out of sell them, make more money. Amen. <laughs> uh, on that, my uh, Think Like a Billionaire book, that's my most successful book I've had. Sold nearly a million copies of this all over. It's in eight different languages. It's, um, it's all about changing how you think. As a man thinks, so is he or she. Yeah. If we can think like a wealthy, wealthy people think differently than the average person. Think differently about money, about time, about business. They think about investing. They think differently. And if we can begin to think like a wealthy person, then we can get the hands of the wealth into the Christian's hands. Because the whole purpose of the book is blessed to be a blessing. Amen. Out of my abundance, Corinthians talks about, I can give for every good work. Imagine if this place was filled with millionaires and billionaires. Right? What could we do in Washington together? And uh, who wants this one? Loudest Lulu gets this. Uh, right there. There you go. There you go. Amen. Amen. My follow-up book just came out last year. It's doing well. Called Think Like a Business Heir. And uh, over the years, I've started about 25 businesses, had about 18 of them fail. Uh, how many people know that you've got to fail to, to be successful? And I, and I did it great. And uh, you can learn from my mistakes. I have one of the largest knife companies in America. I have one of the largest gun companies in Arizona. I have a pickleball paddle company that I'm doing with my children. I have a Cerakote company. I, I have a lot of companies going on. And uh, I just opened up a preschool, so I'm doing that now also, just because I like to have fun. And uh, <laughs> this will tell you how to start a business, or if you have a business, how to build it, how to market it, how to get it out there. It's all and a lot of my mistakes that you don't have to do. And uh, so give this one to whoever you choose. Come on with somebody out there. For, the, for those of you that fought on the way to church today, married for life, how to get in and out of fights. <laughs> He, sna <laughs> he just snatched that thing out of my hand. <laughs> About a decade ago, um, I watched my parents who, they fought heavily <laughs> when I was a child. And I saw them all of a sudden get out of a fight in less than a few minutes. And then to watch it transform to, even today, they're like two, three seconds in. I, I, it's crazy. We think that in marriage, if that person can become perfect, that'll be a great marriage. That's not, no, that, that ain't going to happen that way. What it is, is having grace and mercy in the spite of their mistakes that they make. Amen. And Amen. so this book will teach you how to get out. Because we're going to, men, we're going to say dumb things. When, ladies, I'm going to tell you what, he's going to say something dumb today. <laughs> he already said it. He already said it on the way to church. And we can fight about it all day, fight about it for an hour, or we can just let it go. It's a mistake. Walk in grace and get out of the fight and enjoy our day. I think we spend too much time wasting time on things that do not matter. That book will change and revolutionize your, your marriage. Uh, if you have kids out there, are trained up a parent. Me and my wife have been teaching parenting for 27 years. We've had about 10,000 parents go through this program. And it teaches. Here's the thing. Kids that obey are happy. What, here's what I find that happens in today's culture. We lower our standard to the child mm. rather than raise our child to the biblical Come standard. On. Come on. Amen. Amen. 
And then we wonder why the teenage years, because if you can't get a four-year-old to listen and obey you, you won't get a 16-year-old to listen and obey you. And not just obey, but do it with a happy heart. Because there'll come a day that they'll have a job and the boss will ask them to do something and a good attitude will make success. Everything that we do as parents, come on somebody, is we're parenting for tomorrow. And we get rid of fits and tantrums very quickly, right? You can have emotions in my home. You're just going to have to learn to control your emotions because that's going to make great relationships for you in the future. We did... um, I believe that God downloaded uh, revolutionary information to me and my wife this year while we were teaching on blended family. And so it's not in the book, but it's on the video. So all the videos are free. It tells you where to get them. Uh, but it, it was crazy. I, I, we, we preached this up at Eli's uh, church, and I had about 50 blended families go. That changed our lives. It is really crazy good. And so this is out there. Uh, give that to somebody that wants a Lulu. Blended family. But that's not just, let me say that. That's for all families, just so you all know. That's if you got kids, that's for you. There's one section on the video about blended family. All right, uh, five, uh, two more Millionaire Habits in 21 Days. This is the best book I have on changing the inside. The best book. Didn't sell as much as The Billionaire, but I believe it is the best book on uh, changing how you think, have millionaire habits. And then this is what I'll be talking about today. Me and my brother wrote a book called Thrive. It's God's secret to a thriving life. And give that to somebody. I'm also going to give that to... So I got four kids, uh, our five kids, I got four boys, and we finally had our little daughter. When Savannah was two years old, we were having daddy-daughter time, and so we were hanging out together, you know, playing dolls, doing all that kind of stuff, and finally daddy needed a break, so I said, hey, let's put a a Little Mermaid on, put a video on, and I sat on the couch. A couple minutes later, she, she came in, and she goes, daddy, you want tea? And I go... Sure, I'll have some tea. So she had a little saucer, a little cup, and she handed it to me. Had a little water in it. I took a little drink of the tea. I said, thank you very much, sweetie. A couple minutes go by. She came back. She goes, Daddy, you want tea? And I was a little annoyed because I don't want to drink your stupid tea, but I'm a good dad. (laughs) So I said, sure. Took a little drink. I took a drink of tea up. There you go, baby. And uh, a few minutes later, she comes back in. She goes, Daddy, tea. At this point now, I'm just annoyed. I don't don't want her tea. So I, but I begin to think, I'm like, where in the world is she getting the water? So I go, sweetie, where are you getting the tea? She goes, potty, daddy, potty. (laughs) Praise the Lord, it wasn't a lemonade party, amen? (laughs) How many people know that the world will give you what they call tea and it's just potty water? Come on, somebody out there. What you see on CNN and Fox and all the news and everything of the culture in the day, what they're trying to do is give us a system that is broken and does not work. It's potty. But God gives us a system that does work. His system is exactly backwards to the world system. But what today we talk about is how to have a life that thrives by putting joy and victory up ahead of us. That we can do things today that puts joy up ahead. Right? Jesus went to the cross for the joy set before him, that it was that there was joy up there. Got to go through some little bit of pain, but up ahead is going to be great victory up ahead. Same thing for you and I. Romans 8 talks about this, that a life that is set to the spirit will produce life, but one that is set to the flesh and the desires of the flesh produces death up ahead. So I'm either putting joy or pain ahead of me. You can eat fast food and out and drink all the soda and not exercise. You're putting pain up ahead of you. Or you can exercise and eat right and get fruits and veggies and do all that and get rid of all of the, all the processed food. And what am I doing? I'm putting some joy up ahead. I can do that in my job. You can be mad and upset and talk bad about the boss and look at ways that you can get away with stuff and not work hard. You're putting pain up ahead. Or I can go to the Word of God that says, do all things as if I'm doing unto the Lord. I can give my best. I can work hard, even if it's a job that's beneath maybe where I should be. But it doesn't matter because man does not give me my bonuses. Man does not give me my raises. God is the one. And so as I work hard, God begins. (laughs) And God is the one. Everything that the world tells us to do, 
produces a broken life. It's all about instant gratification, getting a little bit of joy here, not realizing that it's a whole lot of pain over there. But God's way goes, hey, it's a little bit of pain, but it's a whole lot of joy. Taking your family to church every single week is work. I commend all of you here. That's a lot of work, especially if you've got kids. You get them all ready. Get them every single week. But then you see that what my family, the single most amazing thing that got my family to where we are today, my parents are first generation Christians, is my parents go, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We were in God's house every week. I never woke up on a Sunday and go, what are we doing today? I knew every Sunday, even if I was, I'm like, dad, I'm sick. I got a fever. He's like, good. Take you to church. Get you healed. Come on. That's what we do at church. (laughs) We didn't, we missed church because I had chicken pox. That's the only Sunday that I ever missed church. And you see the benefits, what it does. Every statistic known to man shows that marriages are 98% successful that go to church and hold hands once a week. Children are smarter, literally smarter. Harvard did a study on it last year. They get better grades. They are 500 times less likely to have drug and alcohol problems. They're 600 times less likely to, to deal with suicide. You find that every statistic shows that homes that are in God's house, it's work. But The joy I set ahead of me is priceless. I love movies. Me and my wife are big. You see the Marvel, especially Marvel. We love to go out to movies. Now, Lulu, Lulu. (laughs) That kind of Lulu. (laughs) Uh, Now, here's, here's one of the things in the marriage. I love previews. I look so forward to seeing the movies coming up. I get all excited. My wife doesn't like previews. She could care less. She wants to show up right when the movie uh, uh, starts. And so we have come up with a compromise. And the compromise is is we miss the previews. That's our compromise. (laughs) So uh, we're going to see a movie. And of course, we show up, and the movie's starting, and my wife, she's so sweet. She's like, go in, I'll get the popcorn, but I'm not built that way. I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. I'll get your popcorn, I'll get your drink, get your all goodies, i get it all. Now we're walking, of course, she goes, i got to go to the bathroom, and I'm like, well, that's enough. And so, <laughs> so I tell her where the seats are, because I will only go to theaters where I can reserve my seats. I reserve it, I, I like to make sure that we have people no sitting by us, and I can, nobody's kicking my chair, that's, that's how I do movies now. And so, I sit down, Get in the movie, right? I got, I'm waiting for Holly to come right here. Here's her seat. I told her this is a seat. And now I'm in the movie. I'm one of those people, I live the movie. I'm dodging and ducking and, and there's action going on. My heart, right? I'm like, no, right? And so all of a sudden, there's a break in the action. My heart is beating. I take a breath and I'm like, oh, Holly's here. And so I go and to hold her hand, get my hand all interlocked in there. And as I did that, I go, man, she has got some big old hands. I never noticed how large hands... <laughs> Man, I should have her break my crab all the time. There's a big old mitt on her. And then I'm like, I don't remember her having that much hair on her arm. That's a con- <laughs> So I looked over, and then I went, well, I know she doesn't have a beard. I know for a fact she does not have a beard. <laughs> so we looked at each other for a moment. I let go. <laughs> went back to the movie for another hour and 27 minutes of very being uncomfortable. <laughs> and I looked over. My wife had sat in this seat. And I held her hand and I went, oh, that's much nicer. I like that one. (laughs) Movie gets over, lights come up. We looked at each other and then we just went our business. We we never said nothing. It's our secret. (laughs) And here's the thing. You can hold hands with the world. It's not, it doesn't even feel right. Or you can hold hands with your bride, with cry, right? With cry, right? You can hold hands over here and do things God's way. God's way always has good results. The world's way has horrible results. No matter how they paint it, they want to paint it up as an amazing, amazing picture. But even the statistics do not lie that God's way produces a great life. You will not have a kingdom life doing things the world's way. If I want a kingdom life, I have to have a kingdom living. And as we talk about today, one of the greatest things we can do to put victory up ahead of us. I'm going to give you that secret today. How do I put victory ahead? How do I put joy up ahead? We're going to find that in Chronicles today. 2 Chronicles and uh, uh, verse tw- or, uh, chapter 20, verse 21. 
And uh, Jehoshaphat right now is going through uh, a mess. They have an army that is against them that is so large you can't even count it. There is no way that Israel possibly can win. No possible way that they can win this. And so Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. And they went out ahead of the army. Now, I love teaching this to this church because I know that in here is a tremendous amount of you all that have given your life and served this amazing country that we have. But I can tell you this. I'll bet you not one of you have ever had a commander, had a general, had a colonel, had a captain, right? Any of these, a sergeant, who said, all right, today, today's plan is we're invading. We're going to send the praise team up ahead. Hey, Bubba, yeah, no machine gun for you today. You got a tambourine. I want you to work that tambourine today. Yeah, just really shake that thing. All right, all right. And Steve over here, I need Steve, I need, you're going to be on the flag today. Just work that flag. Just, mama. the rest of you, we're going to sing, this is how we fight our battles. This is what we're going to do. You'll never find that. Right? Because the world does things differently. But Jehoshaphat sends the praise team out and the impossible victory is what they get. They win the battle. And here's the thing you have to realize. The world's way is that I praise after the victory. After I get the win, that's when I praise. But God's way is opposite. He says you praise and it brings a victory. The, right? the world says that I respond to victory with praise. But God goes, no, no, no. Victory has to respond to your praise. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You find that your praise begins to bring the victory in your life. It begins to bring everything that you need. You know, Paul and Silas are in prison. Tomorrow they're going to be executed. And many Christians, when we hit bottom, right? If we were there, many of us would be talking about, you know, this is not fair. You know, God, where are you at? Oh, I, I give and I give and I, give. I tithe. I go to church and look at how my life is all exploded. Everything is a big old mess. Easily everything that Paul and Silas could have been saying. And how how'd you let this happen to us, God? See, it's easy to praise God when you're on the mountaintop. Come on. But the question for you is, can you praise God when you're in the valley? Yeah. Come on, somebody. Lulu. And Paul and Silas are sitting in there and they're just praising God. And what happens is everything has to respond. This earth, everything that God put on this earth has to respond to praise. The jail begins to shake. The shackles fall off. Everything begins to change. Instantly, they went from defeat to victory because victory always responds to praise. If you and I can learn to praise God, I know it's a mess. Some of you sitting here today and maybe your relationship is a mess. Maybe your finances are a mess. Something is a mess in your life and we can be mad and be upset or you can praise God and watch as God brings the victory to your doorstep. As God opens up doors of opportunity, you lost your job, my dad, when I was in the seventh grade, he finally got a job that was making good money. And he comes home, he goes, hey guys, got laid off today. He said, but you know what? God will provide for us. And let's go out to eat. And we went out for steak, which was Arby's in my day. So we went and had a steak dinner. <laughs> oh, that was living. We got a steak. And my dad continually talked every day of how our God provides. And would you know, he was laid off for seven months and God provided more money than he would have made with a job. It was the most money he had ever made in his life in those seven months. How many people know that God's praise works? God's praise brings, come on, brings to you. God's praise. So, uh, like in my oldest son, when he was four years old, I was, I was watching and we were hanging out some and all of a sudden it was time to go. And so I went to turn off the TV and just then they had, they used to do these little news things where they go live tonight at five. And it said, a woman strips for a cop. And I shut that off and I'm walking, licking over to get his shoes on. And my oldest son, he goes, Dad, why would, a, why would a woman strip for a cop? And, and I said, uh, to get out of the ticket. And he goes, well, why wouldn't the policeman give, give her a ticket? Because well, she wouldn't have any clothes on. Right? I'm just talking to him. And he goes, well, why? Does he want to see her without clothes? And then I went, oh, no. No, no, no. We're having the talk. I'm not ready for the talk. I'm ill prepared for this talk. 
My dad did a horrible job at the talk. I'm still confused to this day how you exist, son. I don't know. And so I can't do the... It has something to do with Marvin Gaye music. Like, that's all I know. I mean, my wife listen to that, and then we get kids. And so I don't know. So I'm like, I said, oh, I'll tell you I'll, in the van, right? And I'm like, okay, he'll forget. He forgets everything. Get him out of the van, buckled in. I'm about to back up. And all of a sudden from the back, he goes, so did, does a cop want to see her without her clothes on? <laughs> and I'm like, son, I'll take you to Disneyland. What do you want? Let's just not do this. And I said, I, yes. He goes, do you like to see mom without clothes on? <laughs> I'm like, well, a little bit. Sneak a peek once in a while, it's not bad. I, I don't mind it. He goes, so dad, when, when do I get to see girls without clothes on? And I went, oh my gosh, Holly's gonna kill me. I don't know, I'm, I'm ruining him single-handedly, all on my own. I said, not for a long time, son, not for a long, long time. You gotta get all the way through school, get through high school, you gotta graduate from college, you gotta get a job, you meet the right girl that God has for you, you get married, and all he gets out of there, he goes, Dad, I don't wanna get a job. Go. <laughs> so that made me mad, because I'm like, I'm raising a lazy pervert. And so, <laughs> so I go, I go, son, no. I said, listen to me, son. I said, you're going you're gonna to get through school. You're going to go to college. You're going to get a job. You're going to work hard because Andersons work hard. We do everything. We give everything. He goes, well, Dad, what kind of job? What, what, what do I do when I grow up? And I thought to myself, because I, we teach parenting. So I got excited. I'm like, this is a parenting moment where I can speak into the heart of my child. And so I said, son, here's the thing. You can do whatever you want to do. You can be whatever you want to be. If you can dream it, son, you can do it. You could be a doctor. You could be a lawyer. You could be president of the United States if you wanted to be. I said, son, what do you want to be when you grow up? He goes, dad, I want to be a cop. (laughs) But you know what I want to be? I want to be a praiser. Because no matter what God puts in front of me, if we are praisers, come on, somebody out there, no matter what job, no matter what position, God will open up doors of opportunity. He is our promoter. He is the one, not the world. So many times we look to society, we look to the government, we look to the city, and all, if everybody else would change, because we think that the world somehow is going to be the ones that's going to bring blessings. But my God is the one that brings blessings to me. Hebrews, um, I love this scripture here. Hebrews uh, 13, 15. Says, therefore, by him, let us continually. Somebody say continually. Continually. Okay, not just once in a while, not just on the weekend, but continually offer the sacrifice. Most praise is sacrifice. Most of the time, we don't feel like praising, right? Most of the time, it's in the middle of our problem. It's a sacrifice a praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. There is the power of life and death in my tongue, right? You, you, you can speak negative about your marriage. You can speak negative about your children, speak negative about your life, or you can give God praise and give God thanks. Thank you, God, for what you have given me. Thank you, God, for that annoying job that you have given to me, Lord, that, Lord, you are opening up opportunities. It's a sacrifice, but I find myself praising God. David, the great praiser, the great praiser, because I know a lot of men are like, well, you know, it's not so so manly. David was one of the most manly men. That man, he grabbed grabbed a lion by the beard and slayed a lion, slayed a bear, killed Goliath. He was a warrior, but he first was a praiser. He was a praiser. And you watch his life of praising. He went from the bottom to the top through praise had lots of problems, bigger problems than anyone in this room has ever had. Had all of Israel chasing a king, trying to kill him. Yet David was always praising. One of my favorite parts in the Bible is whenever David goes, he talks to his soul. He goes, oh soul, why are you downcast? 
come on, I know things don't look good. And then he'll just talk himself up. He goes, but my God is able. My God is my shield and he is my buckler. That my God has never let me down and he will not let me down. He is always protecting and guiding me. He is making a path. He is pres- he's my enemies. He's doing a table in front of my enemies. My God is my deliverer. And you find that it was the praise that opened up the opportunities. David's praise, victory had to respond to it. Victory always responded to it. David went from shepherd boy to king of Israel through praise. And you and I can go from the bottom to the top with our praise. In 2008, I owned about $15 million worth of property, five different pieces of property. And the real estate crash happened and uh, lost everything, including our for life home. Our home, we, 10 years with my family, grew with, built, they raised in this house. We lost our house. 40 years old, I'm moving in with my parents. The definition of a loser is living in your parents' basement at 40 years old. This is where my life was, right? And so me and my wife, we decided that every morning we would start our morning off with praise. And so we had it on our phone and we, and we would just start our morning off and we would just pray. We would just sing praises to God in the morning. I had nothing to praise God about at that time. I lost everything. I lost everything in my life. Everything. I, I, I was such a failure in that moment. But that is our moment that me and Holly, every morning, we never missed a morning of praising God. And wouldn't you know, within seven years, everything the devil had stolen was replaced and more in our lives. Can I get an amen? and a Lulu out there. I know, I know many people whose life is in the same place from 2008. They lost everything because they got mad at God. They got out of church and it was God's fault instead of Paul and Silas seeing that moment in their life and saying, yeah, God, because I easily could say, God, where were you at? And how come this happened? I prayed, I tithe, I go to church. Why this happened? But I just said, God, I praise you. I praise you on the top and I'll praise you on the bottom. I live a life of praising. And God opened up doors of opportunity that no man could ever open up in my life. Same thing for you. Wherever you're at, praise. If you're on the bottom, praise is the secret to getting to victory. Victory has to respond to your praise. I'm going to close with this last story. When I was going over this teaching with my wife, she brought up this cool story of David. Uh, I was like, oh, okay. And she was telling me David had just got the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, he'd been trying to get this and finally got it. And uh, so as he gets the Ark of the Covenant, he's taking it back to Jerusalem. Now, the Ark of the Covenant represents you and I, right? God lived in the Ark, and now God lives in us. And so now we are the Ark. He's taking it to Jerusalem. And what he had them do is he had Israel every six steps stop and praise God. And when Holly told me that, I said, that's the most obnoxious thing I've ever heard in my life. Every six steps, they have to stop and pray. You know how long it would take? I have a mathematical mind. You know how long it would take them to go a mile, two miles, five miles, ten miles? Every six steps, they have to stop and praise God. I let that crock pot in me overnight, and I thought about it, meditated on it. And it, it seemed to come to me the next day. David was teaching them the secret to his own success in an obnoxious way. He's like, I need you every six steps to praise God, to praise Him every six. And here's the thing, church. What if every six steps in 2024, we as a church, we praise God? It became obnoxious of how much we do. We continually praise God. We get up in the morning and the first thing we do is we give God praise. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and I will be glad. And God, you've got a great day ahead of me. I'm thankful for the opportunity. You go home, go downstairs in your tiny little apartment. Thank you, God, I prayed for this place. I know you got my own house for me in the future, but right now I celebrate what you have given me. And you go outside to your 25-year-old Nissan Sentra with 283,000 miles on it. And as it starts up, you go, thank you, God. That's a miracle every time that car starts. Every time it starts up. That's an act of the angels right there. 
And as you go to the job that you used to hate, you go, thank you, God, I prayed for this job. Yes. And I know you're going to use me and you have me here to maybe touch a life, to get somebody saved. And I'm going to give my best in this job today because man's not my promoter. God, you will promote me. Yes. You have the perfect place for me in the future, God. I thank you. And as you go through traffic, you're like, thank you, God, for Seattle traffic, Lord. Oh, this is a blessing. <laughs> I got time now that I can listen to podcasts and I can listen to some stuff. And so I'm just enjoying this time of praise. You get home and if you're single and you want to be married, thank you God that you have the perfect person in the perfect time. And right now I'm just working on me, but I know that in your timing, you'll bring, not in the man's timing, but in your timing, Lord. And if you are married, thank you God for the gift that you have given me. The Bible says there's not a greater gift than the gift of a wife. And so I praise you God. And every six steps, we praise. I'm going to tell you what, you will be so excited and happy every day. You will be putting joy and victory ahead of you. But I want you to think about this, that what happens on the seventh step? Yes, now think of all of the Bible stories and the power of seven. David does six, but on the seventh step is the victory. It's on the seventh lap that the walls go down. It's on the seventh dip in the Jordan that the, the disease fell off. It was on your seventh step that diabetes fell off of your body. It was on the seventh step that cancer had to get out of your body because I've been praising God right there as they're giving me the chemo. I'm praising God because my God is free in this body of sickness and disease. You cannot live in this body. And I glorify my God. And it's on the seventh year that Jacob gets his dream girl. It's on the seventh year that the servants are made free. It's in the seventh step that you are free from those chains and those addictions and those bondages of your life, those things that have held you back, the things that have pushed you back. Six steps of praise. And I'm telling you, the seventh is victory. God rested on the seventh day. You begin to enter into joy and rest that God has designed you for. No more stress, no worry. Right? You can't worry. Paul and Silas were not worried in jail because they knew that God was their source. It wasn't the government. It wasn't the people. It wasn't the jailer. That God is your answer. And praise continually reminds you of who the answer is in your life. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity. It's simple. It's easy. We're going to say a prayer out loud. Believe it and you have it. You know, oftentimes we get the misconception from TikTok and different things that somehow we got to be good enough to get into heaven. That doesn't bear out in the Bible. The Bible says whosoever believes. The Bible says that no man can earn their way into heaven. Means you can't be good enough. Right? You can't earn it. Jesus already paid the price. You're trying to pay something that's been paid for. Jesus died on the cross, not for some sins, but for all of your sins, past, present, and future, because everybody in this room, we're going to make mistakes up ahead. Mistakes may make life hard down here, but it doesn't change my eternity. That's the power in going to church every week because it helps us make less mistakes, do things God's way. Every week I'm downloading, right? I'm in God's house. But it doesn't change my eternity. Eternity is changed by believing in Jesus. So we're going to say a prayer out loud. If you say it with me and believe it, you have it. It's that simple. It's that easy. Everybody say it out loud with me so nobody's embarrassed. Dear Father, Heavenly Father, I ask you right now, you. forgive me forgive of all of my sins. Of all of my sins. I ask you to Jesus, Jesus. Come, into my life, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Lord. and my Savior. I believe, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for all my sins and was raised from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen.